By 1858, British North America was a fractured continent. Both politically and demographically, the prospect of a unified, prosperous Canadian Confederation seemed far-fetched, even to the most ardent confederalist. From the political lens, in the east lay the maritime colonies of Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and New Brunswick, all valuing their autonomy. Hugging the St. Lawrence River and the Great Lakes was a recently unified province of Canada, composed of the Anglophone West Canada and the Francophone East Canada, a province in a gruesome political deadlock. Dominating the Canadian Arctic was the Hudson's Bay Company, a fur trading company claiming huge stretches of land. To the extreme west of the continent were the two nascent colonies of Vancouver and British Columbia, splinters from the Hudson's Bay Company. Demographically, Canada's society was heavily divided, Anglican versus Catholic, Francophone versus Anglophone, Englishmen and Scotsmen versus Irishmen and Frenchmen, Loyalist versus Republican. It is clear that the ancestors of today's Canada lived in a truly fractured society. The question thus arises, how was the Canadian Confederation formed merely a decade later in 1867 amidst all these challenges and what was the driving force behind this apparent sudden unification? This is the historiographer and in this video we will explore the severely overlooked history of the crucial years leading to the formation of the Canadian Confederation. To understand Canadian unification, it is critical to examine the political and historical context behind the provinces that eventually formed the Canadian Confederation. Of the cold shores of the North Atlantic laid the three maritime British colonies of Prince Edward Island, Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, with Nova Scotia being established in 1713 post the British conquest of Acadia from the Kingdom of France. It is from this initial colony that the two other colonies of Prince Edward Island and New Brunswick would be formed, in 1769 and 1784 respectively. The colonization of the Maritimes gained momentum during the late 18th century and continued into the 19th century, fueled by substantial immigration. This influx was primarily driven by Scottish migrants forced out during the Highland Clearances as well as Irishmen fleeing the Great Irish Famine in the 1840s. However, the immigrants also included British Loyalists who fled American persecution after and during the American War of Independence, where their sudden influx led to the formation of New Brunswick in 1784. By 1858, the Maritimes were entering into their Golden Age, mostly led by the powerful elite merchants and bankers. On top of the fishing and farming economies, a developing manufacturing sector was prevalent, with the port of Halifax in Nova Scotia acting as a major hub for shipping as well as for the British Royal Navy. The area hence boasted one of the most expansive manufacturing sectors in British North America, alongside a thriving international shipping industry. This point is important to understand, as it was a significant reason for the reluctance of the maritime provinces to accept the idea of the Confederation, fearing it would chip away at their prized autonomy. Certainly, it would eventually take pressure from Britain's colonial secretaries themselves to urge unity, and even then, not all provinces joined the Confederation in 1867, a fact to be explored later in the video. Meanwhile, the main driving force behind the Canadian Confederation was the province of Canada, fully established in early 1841 after the 1840 Act of Union. By the late 1830s, Britain had long feared the loss of its North American possessions to popular discontent within the colonies, just like what had happened with the American Revolution. This led to Britain adopting a carrot and stick policy and alternating between brute force and compromise with the French Canadians. These fears were exacerbated after the French Canadian Patriot Rebellions of 1837 to 38 against British rule, which were brutally put down. To better understand these rebellions, Great Britain appointed Lord Durham to become the Governor General and High Commissioner to British North America, with the responsibility for preparing a report on the Canadian rebellions of 1837-38. In January of 1839, Lord Durham completed his famous report on the affairs of British North America. His major recommendation was to unite the Canadas in order to save Anglophone Upper Canada from bankruptcy by sharing revenues with Lower Canada, and to accelerate the assimilation of French Canadians 
by creating an equal vote of 42 representatives for each Canada in the Parliament, despite Lower Canada's initially larger population. Lord Durham characterized the French Canadians as a people with no literature and no history. It is not surprising, therefore, that the Act of Union was hastily adopted by the British Parliament in 1840, forming the Province of Canada, which was comprised of a majority Anglophone West Canada, formerly Upper Canada, and a majority Francophone East Canada, formerly Lower Canada. The province was ruled by a diarchy of sorts, with West and East Canada electing a premier each, where both premiers would rule the province in a co-premiership. In 1848, responsible government was accorded to the province of Canada, marking the start of Canada's democracy. Yet, as one can guess, the different competing interest groups led to much instability in the government. Certainly, instability and attempts to assimilate the French-speaking population were the theme of the day, with the province changing capitals six times over the course of its history. By the early 1850s, aided by massive migrations from the British Isles, a trade treaty with the US, a manufacturing boom, and high birth rates, the Anglophone population of Upper Canada had eclipsed that of Lower Canada, and Anglophones in West Canada began suddenly demanding a representation by population system in the Parliament, instead of the rigid 42 by 42 elected MP system, which had benefited them before becoming the majority. By the late 1850s, therefore, the Act of Union of 1840 had become increasingly archaic and unworkable. During that period, any government unluckily charged with governing the province faced obstacles in enacting legislation due to the requirement of a double majority. Indeed, approval from both Canada East and West sections of the Legislative Assembly was necessary for any law to proceed. And given that the French-speaking and English-speaking representatives were at each other's throats, this led to a state of political impasse dominating right until 1864. As such, ideas for union with other British colonies in a strong confederation in which each province had its own premier were being floated around in Canadian newspapers as a means for a better political system, an improved economy, and unified protection against American expansionism. It is with this precise unifying aim that in 1859, a delegation from the province of Canada, led by the then joint premier, French-Canadian Sir Georges-Étienne Cartier, the leader of the leading conservative Parti Bleu, and two other enthusiastic politicians, set course to the United Kingdom to present the British Parliament with a project for a confederation of the British North American colonies. In a bizarre move from the British Secretary of Colonial Affairs, as well as the Parliament, the proposal was received by the London authorities with polite indifference. In other words, the Canadians were dismissed empty-handed, much to the chagrin of Queen Victoria, who feared that, one day, the British Empire might lose Canada, saying, this shows the impossibility of us being able to hold on to Canada. But we must struggle for it, and by far the best solution would be to let it go as an independent kingdom under an English prince. The Queen, however, had underestimated the loyalty of Canadians to the British Crown, as few Canadians supported independence from the British Empire given the strong influence of the United Empire Loyalists, a pro-British organization. In any case, it would take outside influences to truly kickstart the process of unity and have Britain throw its full support for a strong confederation. The start of the American Civil War by mid-1861, which showed every Canadian that war was too close for danger, and that a united Canada is not only in the best interests of all North American British colonies, but also in the best interest of Britain herself who, burdened by the administration of multiple colonies, believed that Canada should put more effort into defending its borders. Initially, the government of John A. Macdonald's Liberal Conservative Party and George Etienne Cartier's Parti Bleu, which reigned from 1857 to 1862, tried to bring about the idea by the early 1860s. However, they faced severe opposition due to the nature of Canada's paralyzed political system. Their government was toppled in 1862, with five more governments forming in the four next years, alternating between different leaders, chief among them the liberal reformer George Brown, with all governments being failures. 
At the same time, reports of the American Civil War's violence shocked British North America, who attributed it partly to a weak US federal government and faults of republicanism. To add to the anxiety of Canadian politicians, concerns mounted over Britain's declining defense commitments in the case of potential American aggression. Being fed up with the political deadlock, and with time running out regarding the possibility of American expansionism as the American Union was now on its way to defeat the Confederacy, only four years later in 1864, George Brown's liberal reformers and John A. Macdonald's liberal conservatives in Canada West, two sworn enemies, were stunningly working with George Etienne Cartier's Parti Bleu in Canada East. In a spirit of compromise, three of the four big parties in the province of Canada all set aside their political differences in what was known as the Great Coalition Government, thereby laying the groundwork for nation building to create a powerful, united confederation under the British Crown. The formation of the Great Coalition was the greatest moment in Canadian political history. Much credit is accorded to French Canadian Georges Etienne Cartier for his willingness to compromise, and he famously said, En haut de tout, nous sommes Canadiens. Above all, we are Canadians. Simultaneously in early 1864, there were talks to unify the maritime colonies of Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and Prince Edward Island. The province of Canada hence asked to be included in these discussions, and on the historic day of the 1st of September 1864, the Charlottetown Conference was held in Prince Edward Island. In the conference, the Canadian delegation proposed the formation of a confederation with a strong federal government. The proposals also included, among others, the appointment of a Canadian Governor General by the British Crown, the assumption of provincial debt by the central government. Revenues from the central government were to be apportioned to the provinces on the basis of population the building of an intercolonial railway system to link Montreal and Halifax, giving Canada access to an ice-free winter port and the Maritimes easy access to Canada and Rupert's land. The last point was an offer Nova Scotia could not refuse. However, there was some cynicism from the Maritime newspapers, who nevertheless valued their autonomy where local newspapers wrote, with their arguments and their empty blandishments, it looks as if these Canadian gentlemen had it all their own way. As a direct consequence of the Charlottetown Conference, a second meeting was scheduled to be held in Quebec in October of 1864. The second vital nation-building conference, the Quebec Conference, was held in October of 1864. Delegates convened in Quebec and discussed the Confederation proposal in more detail. The conference passed the 72 Quebec resolutions, mostly drafted by Sir John A. Macdonald, which is why he is referred to as the architect of the Confederation. These resolutions outlined a detailed proposal for the constitution of the Confederation of the British North American provinces. For example, the defunct system of the province of Canada was to be replaced by two separate provinces in the case of Confederation, where West Canada would become Ontario, while East Canada would become the province of Quebec. All provinces, however, would be headed by a powerful federal government. The men participating in these conferences would become known as the Fathers of the Confederation. Interestingly, the 72 resolutions were inspired by America's system. It is on this inspiration that Sir Macdonald said in 1865, by adhering to the monarchical principle, we avoid one defect inherent in the Constitution of the United States. Post the Civil War in 1865, there were open discussions in US newspapers for annexing Canada, as well as Rupert's Land, as revenge for Britain's support for the Confederacy. The US cancellation for the Reciprocity Treaty of Free Trade, established with the US in 1854, inflamed the same fears, thereby motivating British North American colonies to move quicker to ensure unification. Following the Quebec Conference, the province of Canada endorsed a bill sanctioning the Union. However, the Union faced significant opposition in the maritime provinces. It wasn't until 1866, and after intense pressure and urging from Lord Carnarvon, the Secretary of the Colonies, that New Brunswick and Nova Scotia passed resolutions in favor of the Union. Even then, Prince Edward Island and Newfoundland refused to join. In December of 1866, 16 delegates from the province of Canada, New Brunswick, 
and Nova Scotia journeyed to London. Queen Victoria expressed her keen interest in the Confederation, believing it would lead to greatness and prosperity for the provinces, saying, I take the deepest interest in Confederation, for I believe it will make the provinces great and prosperous. It is thanks to her continued support that Queen Victoria would ultimately become known as the mother of the Confederation. During meetings at the Westminster Palace Hotel, the delegates examined and endorsed the 72 resolutions agreed upon in Quebec. The decisions of the conference were then forwarded to the colonial office. After a break for Christmas, the delegates reconvened in January of 1867 to draft the British North America Act, where the name Dominion of Canada was adopted after much debate. Finally, the Canadians had finalized their draft for the British North America Act. The Act was presented to Queen Victoria on the 11th of February 1867 and swiftly introduced in the House of Lords the following day. It was promptly approved by both the House of Lords and the House of Commons. The date for union was set as July 1st, 1867. The Confederation was finally declared on the 1st of July 1867. We do ordain, declare, and command that, on and after the first day of July, 1867, the provinces of Canada, Nova Scotia, and New Brunswick shall form and be one dominion, under the name of Canada. In August of 1867, Sir John A. Macdonald was elected as Prime Minister of the Dominion of Canada, becoming one of the greatest Prime Ministers in Canadian history, barring some scandals. The 1st of July 1867 is to this day regarded as Independence Day for Canada, and over the next decades, and mainly under the leadership of Sir John A. Macdonald, Canada would expand by more than 15 million square kilometers to encompass all of the ex-British colonies of North America, fulfilling its motto, Amare Uskad Mare, from sea to sea, from the Atlantic to the Pacific, a nation united. If you like this video, then consider subscribing to spread the history. This has been the historiographer, and for now, see you in the next video.